I'm going to be here alone. First Peter chapter 2. Thank you for the invitation, Pastor D. First Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the headstone or the head of the corner. A stone of stumbling. Listen now. He's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. But you, look at your neighbor and tell them, but you, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy ethnos, ethnicity, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you. Called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You're not just in the light, you are into the light. Which in time past you were not a people. But you are now the people of God. You had not obtained mercy, but now... You have obtained mercy. Verse 9, the message Bible reads like this, but you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests. You are a holy nation. You are God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I'm going to preach a message for three hours today. I'm going to preach just a few minutes, a message called No Ordinary People. I need you to say that to three people around you. We are no ordinary, no ordinary people. Now, just look at your next neighbor because they're not liking on you too much and tell them we are some kind of special to God, some kind of special to God. And then you may be seated. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word. Have your way today in Jesus' name. Isn't it great to be in church on Sunday? Well, we love this house, and we appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. No ordinary people. What is ordinary? It literally means to be commonly encountered is defined as just the usual. No exceptional ability, no, de no degree, no certain quality. Ordinary could be defined as average. Ordinary could be defined as average. Words that describe ordinary as normal, typical, common. When I think of ordinary in realms of color, I do not see hues of brightness or illumination. <laughs> I think of colors like beige, tan. Ordinary seems to settle somewhere in the area of commonplace. Ordinary, commonplace. To me, it walks very close, if not arm in arm, with mediocrity ordinary, mediocre. I was thinking this morning as I was sitting in my hotel room praying for every one of you. I didn't know who was coming, but I said, Lord, whoever is there. I thought of this. It takes work to try to make something ordinary that was created in the image of God. You really got to mess things up to dumb down God's creation. I was watching the documentary recently called Arnold. I'm sure none of you watched that. <laughs> you too saved for Arnold. <laughs> but Arnold said something pretty incredible. He said, I live my life by two words, move forward. Leave where you were every day. Pretty strong words. We progress from ordinary 
to extraordinary by moving forward. I like walking out of a movie and saying that movie was extraordinary. I like walking out of a lunch with someone special and saying that lunch was extraordinary. It was just not an ordinary lunch. And I especially like walking out of church saying that was an extraordinary service today. Now some of you came for the usual. Some of you came for the commonplace church service. But there are those in here today that came with a desire. Wait a minute. You came with a determination. Wait, wait a minute. Let's go higher. You came with a need. And you said, I'm going to get something from the Lord today. And you have predetermined you're leaving this building saying that was an extraordinary church service. Ordinary will never put a demand to drive toward extremes. Ordinary will never really pursue excellence. It'll never pursue that because excellence isn't a place you arrive. Excellence is a thing you do. <laughs> to make an ordinary marriage extraordinary, you got to put a little extra Talk in the building, Pastor Rick. To make just an ordinary marriage an extraordinary marriage, you have to put a little extra in the marriage. It's going to get quiet now. Matter of fact, some of y'all's palms are real sweaty sitting there next to your, to your spouse. This generation says you're being extra. What they're saying is he's being a little dramatic. He's being too excessive. He's trying too hard. Matter of fact, some of you have already drawn that conclusion about the speaker today. He's a little extra. Bump your neighbor and tell him, you ain't seen nothing yet. Just, just sit there for a minute. <laughs> In reality, extra is all about adding to what is usual. Yeah. In reality, extra is all about adding to what is common. I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired of common. Ordinary says maintain. Extraordinary screams push to the extreme. Extreme comes from the word exterior. Going to great or, listen to it, exaggerated lengths. Thank God for my wife. Bless you, Jesus. Because she will go to ex exaggerated lengths, extreme lengths, to show me her love. And you know what she's going to get right back? Extraordinary love. Extreme or extraordinary has to do with exceeding the ordinary. As I was praying about it, I realized it really has to do with expectations. Someone once said an ordinary person is someone who follows the status quo. A person who does things that are, that are accepted by society as they are supposed to be done. But something extraordinary goes above and beyond, listen to it, what is expected. Extraordinary goes above and beyond what is expected. Now, you would say, what does this have to do with God, and what does this have to do with church, Pastor Rick? I'm going to show you the kind of God you serve. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly Above all that you can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Now unto him 
who is able to do exceeding, to do extraordinary. I don't want God to do just the usual today. I want him to do something unique, something unusual, something conspicuous. Now, the polarization just set in. Yeah, the polarization just set in. There are those of you that are here today that has said, I'm going to get what God has for me. But you've also said, I hope it's something so exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think that you've decided in your mind until I think it, he can exceed it. So if you came here in here with nothing, you gave him nothing to work with. But you came in here, if you came in here with an expectation, then he is going to supersede what you expected him to do. Tell your neighbor, give God something to work with. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. Let's, let's explore some things today. All right, are y'all with me so far? You still like me? I like you. <laughs> you better love me. You ain't got to like me, but you better love me. Let's talk about this idea in relation to ordinary versus extraordinary. Let's look at the idea of the difference. We must arrive at a place of maturity that allows an appreciation for contrast. Say that word, contrast. The text said, you are, but you are, but you are. You were this, everything listed in verse 7 and 8, but now in verse 9, you are this. You were disobedient. You were offended. But now you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, right? A holy nation, a peculiar people. There is a difference in what you were and what you are. I'm not everything that I want to be, but I'm thankful today that I am not. Are you grateful today that you are not what you used to be? Everyone say, there is a contrast in what I am and what I used to be. There's a difference. There's a contrast. Whew. The contrast must extend beyond your conversion. It must extend beyond I was a sinner and now I am saved. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Where there is no contrast, there is a lack of recognition of consecration. Where there is no contrast, you do not recognize consecration. Because consecration is a line of demarcation. Consecration says, not only am I sanctified, but my hands are full of purpose now. Stay with me. Where there's no contrast, no difference, there's a lack of recognition of consecration and there's a lack of respect where there is no contrast. You live in a nation that is attacking respect. You live in a nation that is inundated with innuendos, with phraseology that denotes the idea that there really is no contrast. The lines are not just blurred. The lines are being erased. In the beginning, God did not create just chaos. He created contrast. We know it was chaotic because the earth was without form. There was no order and it was void. It was empty. So we always preach anything God starts, it's usually started with K. 
chaos. And it evolves into cosmos. Preaching good, Pastor Rick. <laughs> but we forget to talk about the contrast. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created contrast. He created the heaven and the earth. Contrast. On the first day, he created more contrast. Verse 2. The earth was without form, void. The, the darkness covered the deep. The Spirit of God moved on the face of the deep. And God said, watch now, let there be. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light and the darkness he called. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So you created a 24-hour period, divided it in half, created a contrast, and called it day and night, darkness and light, evening and morning. Yesterday, I asked Reverend, I do this often, what is my name? He cut his eyes at me right here. I said, River, what is my name? You know what he said? Daddy. I started to say, no, it's Ricky. <laughs> but he needs to call me. So you know what I told him? That's right. To you. <laughs> my name is Daddy. Now to your mama, my name is Big Daddy. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That is not in my notes, but that was awesome right there. We create, we create problems when we try to keep everyone ordinary, everyone the same, everyone usual. God created contrast. I, sometimes I look around at my house, I look at River and I say, who is that? And he says, Uncle Rand. He don't call him Randy, he calls him Rand. He calls Dustin Brudder, Brudder, B-R-U-D-D-E-R, Brudder. <laughs> he calls Crystal Sissy. What is he doing? He has developed a category that they all fit in. He don't call Crystal, Crystal. He calls her Sissy. That is his sister. I don't want him looking at me and him the same way. He is brother. I am daddy. Randy is uncle. Y'all stand with me? There is a contrast. Elisha gave Elijah a contrast when he did not say my friend. He said my father. He created a category that only Elijah could feel. The problem with the church today and this generation today is we want everybody to be the same. Where there's no contrast, there's no respect. Contrast. God created them male. And female, he created man and woman. He made them husband. We have a son and we have a daughter. We are all alike. We are not the same. You start trying to make everyone the same culture. You have eliminated the power of contrast. I don't even like me enough for me to want you to be me. <laughs> I 
I know my problems. <laughs> and if I had a bunch of me's around me, then where's you? <laughs> you just be quiet, Jovan. She said, yeah, that's right. She tried to whisper it, but I'd heard it. So contrast is a powerful thing. Can you say amen to that? Then there's this designation. You are a peculiar people. That's what our text says. In the Greek, it means you are the ones I have preserved as a possession and to be my own property. The Lord said, come out from among them and be ye separate. My question is, why are we trying to look like them? Some churches you can't tell if you're in a club or a church. Be quiet. Be quiet, Pastor Rick. You're going to offend somebody. Don't want to do that today. I'm convinced that some churches are just glorified youth groups. We talk to mature people like they're teenagers. There's a difference in sucking a bottle and eating a steak. Exodus 6, 7 says, if you will come out from among them, I will take you to be my people. There has to be some kind of distinction between God's people and the world. So when you're trying to figure out how you can negotiate and compromise principles in order to look like, feel like, and be accepted by the world, you have erased the line of difference and the line of demarcation. I will take to you, you will come to me and I will be your God. You will be my people for the Lord's portion is his people. Deuteronomy 32 9. God always has his people. How does he know who his, who his people are? By their spot. Preach pastor. Let me show you something. Deuteronomy 32 5. My people have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of my children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. You know what the word spot there means? A stain. The seal. The spot. I have decided to stain river. I used to clean carpet. The hardest color to get out of carpet is what? Red. You can't get it out. When you get red in that carpet, that red going to be there. I can tell you red is hard to get out. And I thought of this. What color is the blood of Jesus? See, you trying real hard when you're trying to get out from underneath the blood. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take it a bit further. Once you get the blood on you, you cannot get the blood off. You can run but you cannot hide. You can bury yourself in the darkest bar room in this city, but you still got a stain on you. You still got a mark on you. You still got a spot on you. Look at your neighbor and tell them, stain your children. There ought to be a difference in your children and every other child at that school. And if you put the blood on them just right, then when somebody shows up on that campus with a gun, they're going to pass over that child because that child has the blood on them. That's why I believe in pleading the blood of Jesus over our children. Lay your hand on your baby before he goes to that bus and say these words. I plead the blood of Jesus over you. You are God's property. You don't belong to that school. You don't belong to the government. You do not belong to society. You belong to the Lord God Almighty. You are different.
The Lord knows them that are his, 2 Timothy 2.19. It's a mark of authenticity, a mark of ownership, a mark of preservation, a mark of protection. There's a difference. There is a difference. And we must let our kids know that. And we must walk like that. I'm about to end this. We must talk like that. There is, somebody shouted, there is a difference. And there is a designation. Woo. Do you know that we were all designed, fabricated? You were fearfully and wonderfully made. Whew. Before one of your days come to pass, they were already written in the book. Your whole life should be spent finding the script. When you're not in the process of discovering the script, what God has written about you, you will always be chasing ambiguous desires. You will always be chasing distractions. You will always be chasing things that really don't count. And you live in a time and an age where we're building churches to make people feel comfortable with who they are and where they are. And Jesus never lived like that. He was always challenging status quo. He was always pushing people to the limit. He was always extreme, even toward religion. When he told the Pharisees, you are whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones, he did not accept dead religion as a way of following him. And listen how extreme he is. Unless you leave your father and mother, let the dead bury their own. Take up your cross and follow me. How extreme is God to tell Abram, leave your country. And leave your kind. And go to a land that I will show you. When you cling to what is familiar, you will always fantasize about something you'll never enjoy. Your life is full of fantasy and not reality. Reality is locking into God regardless of your feelings. And saying, I'm going to serve him with all of my heart. My convictions, if they don't line up with his word, then I'm living according to some principle of the world. There's a difference in God's word and there's a difference in the world. The world and the word is not the same. Preaching too hard today, Pastor Rick. Let me close this here. The presence of God is the most important thing in your life. Hmm. Take a man out of the presence of God, it's like taking a fish out of water. He will never function properly. Man was created in the presence of God. Woo. If you take a man out of the presence of God, he will always be dis functional he will always act contrary to what God created him to be man Lord have mercy and this is where the church is missing it we come to church for the personality in the pulpit we listen to speakers because they're popular He's got the most thumbs and the most hearts. He's got the most followers on social media. Social media can be very disgusting because it makes a man feel like he's got a platform. Because you got a platform doesn't mean you have something to say. And sometimes you need to recognize how silly some of the stuff people say on their platform really is. All right, go ahead, keep on preaching, Pastor. So that's why there are these subtle attacks from media and on social media about lines. 
we're all the same. We are alike. We're not all the same. Because if I can convince you that we're all the same, then you have no need for authority in your life. If you have no need for authority in your life, you wouldn't recognize its presence if it showed up. So you got churches built on rhetoric and not presence. Because if I can dialogue you into a destiny while placating you and telling you you're great and you're living your best life now, you're just so awesome. Hell no, you ain't that awesome. Everything's okay. We're all, hug me, hug me. Let's just hug. If we just hug, you just need a hug. That's what you tell kids throwing tantrums at school. You just, your mom and dad haven't hugged you. You need a hug. It's okay. It's okay. And they're screaming and jumping and tearing stuff. Oh, it's okay, baby. You just need a hug. No, you need your butt tore off the back side of you. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot we were in church. We're, we're good. Everybody's good. And so you got two white guys at Sonic going, oh, I, I, I want ice cream. No, oh, I do too. You want whipped cream on yours? Yes. And I'm thinking, where's the, the Marlboro man in Harley Davidson? <laughs> Would you like nuts on your ice cream? Sure. I know I'm a preacher, but I'd rather him hear, hear him say, you want to hit this one time? <laughs> Grow up. Are y'all with me so far? Grow up, man. Let's stop, stop washing this thing out. Look, we are not the same. So if you're going to be like that, then you have to push, you have to push and preach watered down messages to people. Because the last thing you want to do is what I'm doing right now, and that's offend somebody. You don't want to do that. Because they can go down the street and be patted on the back and be told they're okay. It's like me canceling the couple when I used to pastor this church. And I, they were going to get married. By the way, don't ever ask me to counsel you. <laughs> don't do that. Because <laughs> my first question is going to be, do you tithe? And when you say no, then I'm saying goodbye. Because I can't help you. Because God said if you bring the tithe, he would rebuke the devourer for your sake. I don't have to counsel you because he's going to get after your devil. So I just look at the girl. Okay. Relationship is about communication, sex, and money. Okay. How is your communication? Great. Okay. Do you know how to submit to your husband? When I said that, she went, ah! I said, are you, are you okay? <laughs> Don't say that word in my presence. I said, what word? Submit. <laughs> now, what do you think I'm going to do? <laughs> submit, 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 submit. <laughs> I'm over my desk screaming, submit, submit. And she's screaming to the top of her lungs and looking at him saying, I'll never submit to you. I said, now, honey, the Bible says. 
submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Go say that! I went like this. You know what that means? Time out. Not go to time out. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. And I looked at him and I said, you going to marry that. <laughs> See, you don't hear that no more. That's the difference. I'm trying to find something else that will get on your nerves. None of this is in my notes. I keep going to my third point to close, and every time I do, I think of something else. You can't tell the difference today in the church and the world. As a matter of fact, most guys don't even open the Bible no more. They read from some book. I am not a motivational speaker. If you want a motivational speaker, then go give all that money to that Tony guy. He'll take your money. And he'll motivate you. Where is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Wow. Yeah. Right. Where are preachers that open the Bible, read a text, and preach the Bible? Come on in this room. If we need anything, we do not need placating words from preachers that ain't got no backbone, that are weak, feeble, See, when you put it all together, I knew we had to dedicate Thaddeus. I knew we had to have church today. I knew all that. And I knew Tim was going to be here. And I knew that's going to be wonderful because Tim is like me. And what we want more than anything is not performance. We want the presence of God. Because if the presence of God don't show up, no difference is going to happen. You're going to leave here the same way you came in. But if God decides to manifest his presence in this building, you're going to move from an ordinary situation situation to an extraordinary situation. You're going to move from commonplace to something extravagant. You're going to move from the usual to the unusual because the presence of God is here. Lord, let your spirit move in this place. That's why Moses says to the Lord, he said, if you, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 12, you've been telling me lead these people, but you have not said who's going with us. You have said, I know you by name and you found favor with me. If you're that pleased with me, teach me your way that I may know and continue to find favor with you. Watch what he says. But remember this, this is your people. This is not Dustin's people. This is not Pastor Rick's people. This is not David's people. It's not Moses' people. It is your people. And we need to get back to the place of recognizing that you are God's property. And watch what the Lord says. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest Watch, watch what Moses says. If your presence doesn't go, then do not send us. Listen to what he says. Because how will anyone know that you are pleased with us and pleased with your people if your presence is not among us? How will people know we are your people if your presence is in here? How will they know the difference if your presence is not among us? I don't know what y'all want. But I'm like David after he fell in the sin with Bathsheba. I'm like him. He said, now, Lord, I know what I did. And I'm asking you, do not take your spirit from me. And watch, we never read this part. And he says, remove not your presence from my life. 
I can do a lot of things with my talent. I can do a lot of things with my ability, but I can't survive unless I've got the presence of God. Oh, for a people that would make the difference in the earth and cry back out to God and say, God, we're tired of the platforms. We're tired of the performance. We're tired of popularity. We want your presence because if your presence ain't here, we just like everybody else. And that's what Moses said. How will they know that we are your people if your presence isn't among us? For your presence among us sets your people apart from all people on the earth. If I'm present, I'm in attendance. But presence is being present and giving off an aura. I'm not just in the building. you feeling me in the building. He didn't come here to be a part of this service. He came here to take. He's not just present. His presence is permeating this atmosphere. See, presence cannot be understood conceptually. As a matter of fact, you don't even know it's there until you experience it. It's the difference in understanding that God is omniscient. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. Versus his manifest presence and his tangible presence. I serve a God that I can feel. Let me come over here. I serve a God I can feel. Which means I know when he's there. And I know when he's not there. And I can't explain it to you. You have to experience it for yourself. But here's what he says. If you will draw near to me, I will draw near to you. I've never felt God because you've never sought God. I've never felt the presence of God. You've never pursued the presence of God. But when you do, when you do, when you take one step toward him, God takes two steps toward you. When you lift your hands and say, God, I want you in my life more than I want anything, God starts invading your life. Woo. When my enemies are turned back, they will fall and they will perish, not because of who I am, but they will fall at your presence. See, once you have the presence of God in your life, the enemy cannot trespass on your territory. He cannot come up on your address when you got the presence of God. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life in your presence in the fullness of joy at your right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. Jovan, I'm going to say it one more time. I love you. And I thank God for you. Here's one of the reasons why. I rope. I get frustrated. I get mad at my staff. I get mad at Dustin. I get mad at everybody. Don't look at me like you got wings hanging over the back of your chair. We all do. We get frustrated with our situations. I cannot tell you a day that I've not walked into my house and all I hear is worship music. And Giovanna and River are there. And the minute I walk over the threshold of that door, my attitude is adjusted. And I have to stop and sit down and go, God, I thank you that your presence is in this house. She puts that worship music on and she leaves it on all day because she knows if we have God's presence in our house, there's no dispute that we can't talk through. There's no argument that we cannot navigate our way through it. 
There's no disorder that will not settle down when you got God's presence. I came here to preach to you today one thing. The most important thing in your life has to be the presence of God. In your presence is fullness of joy and pleasures evermore. The presence of God is a pleasurable environment. The presence of God is a peaceful atmosphere. The presence of God gives you rest. And the book of Acts tells us that there are seasons of refreshment that come from the presence of God. There are seasons of refreshing that come from the presence of of God. I pray place for life never becomes the usual, never becomes the commonplace, never becomes the ordinary, but I pray God packs this church with people who are extreme about being in the presence of God, who are radical about being in the presence of